Well, then I would say thank you to Trevor for joining us tonight for our SESI Open Cafe in honor of Global Accessibility Awareness Day. This is Trevor's third event of the day. My third second. event of the day. I know. <laughs> My second. <laughs> <laughs> we've, been on, we've been on one together virtually, um, and I'm going to let him introduce himself, because if you haven't heard Trevor present, or if you didn't get to at SESICON, I think it's a well worth listening to, but we'll let you get sorted, Trevor, so that we can have a chat at the end, if that's all right. Brilliant. Yeah. And even if you have questions in the middle or anything or during at any stage, that's okay. I don't mind being interrupted. Definitely not precious about that. Kind of working with students has taught me to... <laughs> just accept interruption as just a part of everyday part of life. Um, so thanks a lot for coming along. Uh, so over the next I'd say 25 minutes anyway, at the very least, I'm going to go through uh, just a few accessibility things, um, in particular with digital accessibility. Uh, there's for many reasons more attention on it in the last few years. And it's been interesting talking to staff and students about all these changes happening with accessibility. And in my presentation, I might touch off a few bits of these. So I'm just sharing my screen, go into presentation mode. Hopefully this is going to behave itself. Great. So I think that is that coming across. OK, perfect. Yeah. So. So, uh, yeah. so I've worked in higher education now for about 10 years and it's been really interesting watching us kind of evolve and change over those 10 years in particular, uh, watching accessibility evolve and ultimately more people just becoming more uh, conscious, more cognizant of accessibility, partially because of different laws around accessibility coming into play. The universities are being monitored and checked around their levels of accessibility as well. And the pub, those findings about the levels of accessibility, they're being published as well by the National Disability Authority, which is kind of incentivizing and encouraging people to find as many ways as possible for people to think and talk about assistive technology. So as an assistive technology officer, it's really interesting for me to be kind of involved in some way with this kind of accessibility directive and those changes, um, ultimately because uh, the numbers of blind students are increasing in higher education. So from that point of view, that's one of the many reasons why I'm interested in accessibility, because maybe for a long time, people who are blind have been slightly disadvantaged in education, in particular with digital um, technology, because it hasn't been either made fully accessible to blind people or the information that they interact with, with screen readers that they use to read out information on uh, computer screens, hasn't been made accessible by sighted people. So now that's kind of changing. We as sighted people are becoming more cognizant of what this is, this whole digital accessibility thing and how we can all have a role in that. So uh, I want to introduce this little house. This is going to become a thread in this story about accessibility. And one of the many things that I find about accessibility, just talking to staff over the last few years, is sometimes accessibility feels disconnected from people that they feel like they need to have students with disabilities in their classroom in order to think about uh, accessibility. And really, that's not the case. Um, if you do have students with accessibility, that's definitely a hook to think more about accessibility. But ultimately, um, accessibility is really about something that we all can take advantage in uh, when we think of all this text that's around us all the time. If we have instructions that are written with bullet points and that are minimal and that it has easy to read font and everything is succinct and laid out correctly, that, you know, as a sighted person, that's great for me. I can follow it. And if that digital information is laid out in the same way with the same thought, that definitely helps people, in particular, blind people, to access um, digital information. So when I was thinking about accessibility, I was thinking if there was like a motif or something that could, you know, try to describe these different levels of accessibility and what's involved in the thinking about making something accessible. So uh, because I'm a big fan of the house of like Dior and Coco Chanel and stuff like that, one one mind tends to wander slightly about a house of accessibility and what would that look like? So, uh, and one of the reasons why I love this kind of house of Dior thing is, you know, there's all these 
skilled people working in this kind of house or this domain, really kind of harnessing their skills in all these different capacities to ultimately create this vision uh, that's presented in front of them. And when I kind of think of that sort of accessibility kind of feeds into that in my little mind, it makes sense. Because this house of accessibility can kind of maybe kind of shed a bit of light on what's involved in accessibility. So if people are people brand new to accessibility, are they kind of semi familiar to it? You know, sort of, sort of. Okay, okay, oh, that's okay. So <clears throat> the H in house um, for me is one of the big uh, things. So headings and structure. So I'm going to show a little bit later what that kind of looks like. But in particular, when we talk about accessibility, we need information to be structured, to make sense, and for people to consciously use headings, maybe in like a Google document or Word document and using different heading styles. So if people use heading styles before, like heading one, heading two, perfect. Okay. If you haven't, that's okay to say it. Uh, we're in a safe space. So we can openly talk about what we don't know as well as what we do know. And ultimately, headings and structure is all about laying information out in a way that makes sense to us sighted people as well as uh, it making sense to people who aren't sighted. And then the O for ornamental and de description is really about images and making alt text or what's called alternative text for images. So for me as a sighted person, I can look at an image and I can glean something from that image, whether it's a photograph or a bar chart. Um, or an icon in this case. Um, but for blind people, they are counting on people like me who are making information available to them to put what's called alternative text with that image. So then their screen reader can read out this manually typed in description of what the image is portraying. So if it's a photograph of something, what's the photograph trying to tell us? That needs to be consciously written in. And then the U for house is URLs and links. So we all actively use links all the time. They're fantastic. They're great. You give it instant access to things to around the world, like social media stuff, different websites, PDFs, everything. Uh, and we're great. And usually we're pretty good at sharing. And when it comes to, in particular, creating links for the mass population, so in our websites maybe, or in documents that we're sharing, that those casual ways of sharing links, which would be kind of like uh, what's called a naked URL, um, just that link that we copy and paste from our browser, um, that needs a little bit of tweaking uh, in order to make it accessible. So what we need to do is create a sentence that's kind of a description of that destination of the link. And I'm gonna show that a little bit later as well. And then the S in house, is really about my favorite thing. Um, because I went to art college, I am a slight design nerd and fonts and font styles sort of ignite a whole world of passion for me. So I sometimes have to pull back from font styles because I've realized over time that not everyone is a big fan of fonts like myself, but that's okay. So sans serif fonts in particular are brilliant. So even the slide is made of sans serif fonts. Um, and what's fantastic about sans serifs is that they're very geometric. They're very easy to read. They do exactly what they're supposed to do. And I think they kind of look pretty. So as opposed to maybe other fonts uh, that we see around us, sort of more decorative, or there might be more curves and twists and that, almost like I think of calligraphy when I think of them. So those kind of fonts can be sometimes trickier to read and just take up a little bit of extra time with our minds when we are trying to read a lot of information. So sans serifs are really designed in a way where we can read more effectively for a longer period of time. And that ultimately helps readability, helps us to read information faster and better because it's uh, just laid out more clear. So definitely think about your font styles. And we're gonna chat about it a little bit later. And then E, for the end part of house is about evaluating that accessibility as well of if it's your document, if it's your PowerPoint, that's okay. There are built in accessibility checkers in PowerPoint and as well as Word documents and even uh, different kind of web building tools that you might have used before. Uh, has anyone used accessibility checkers before? 
sort of, maybe, never. Okay, good. Okay, cool. Okay. So, so they come in lots of different forms, but essentially they do the same or similar thing, which is they flag accessibility issues with us. Um, and most of the time, they flag most of the things. And sometimes they don't flag all of the things. But that's okay. So once you're cognizant of what they do or what they don't do or their limitations, that's okay. We can work around them. And that's where this just these kind of training sessions help just to make us more aware of those limitations of accessibility checkers. And that's it for the house. So those are different levels that go into this house of accessibility. And for in particular newbies or people who are just new to accessibility, this kind of a way of making accessibility accessible to them as well as being memorable. So we're just gonna go a little bit deeper into the headings. And for headings to be created in different types of, so like for example, PowerPoint um, is a little bit quirky when it comes to adding a heading. So uh, as opposed to a document, which is a little bit different. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna press escape and we're gonna look at this uh, document, this slide in particular. So here I've got these what look like headings. Hopefully they are real headings. And I can check to see if all my slides have headings. And what I can do is go to the view tab. I think you should be able to see that. So in view, this has been an area of PowerPoint that I didn't explore for a very long time. And it, there's loads of stuff in view. So in the view tab, there's this thing called outline view. And someone called Damien Gordon in TU Dublin introduced me to this way of looking at slides about, I don't know, seven years ago. And when I go down this, I can see that every single slide has a heading. And I can even view those headings right there. So now we can see that they are definitely all have headings. Because if they didn't have a proper heading, one of these would be blank. So let's just take one away. Um, oh. There we go. Oh, did I just delete the slide? I think I just deleted the slide. Okay. So what I can do is I'm just going to remove it right there. And I can even remove the text box right there. So now the slide really has no heading whatsoever. So if I just type in my heading, we can see that that's it. Sorry, now I know. Delete that slide. So here we go. So there's our heading, definitely. And I know 100% proof that that is definitely the heading. So I can now go back to normal view right up here, click on that, and just resume. So, I, and the reason why I suppose um, acknowledging headings and being able to figure out if something does or doesn't have a heading means that, uh, well, one of the many reasons is that for blind students who are using, uh, their screen readers uh, to read out text and information, they really need headings uh, in order to, for their screen readers to be able to tell them uh, what all the headings are and to then, as a result, they can access all the headings and then access the particular heading that they're looking for and then access that particular slide related to that heading. So it helps them to be way more efficient uh, to find information and then retrieve that information quickly and more effectively. Otherwise, without headings, they are just going through the information slide by slide to find the information they need. And that is taking a lot of um, time and concentration from them, uh, as well as affecting their executive functioning. So basically that ease, that strain that's putting, uh, that extra strain that's being put on them to find information um, that should be easier to find because if it's tagged because of headings, it makes a huge difference. So that's okay. So how are people doing? Are they, are you okay? You okay. Any questions so far? No, going good. You're okay. Cool. Okay. So we will resume PowerPoint and we'll just go to the next slide. So a second slide about headings. So by using headings, 
it's helping navigation. So like I said about blind people using their screen reader tools to na navigate all those settings, that's a huge plus in terms of them being able to find information more quickly. Um, also just better for the user experience. Um, they can locate information better, faster, and then from an education experience that makes them more effective then at um, certainly learning what they're doing. And that is great. And all we have to do is consciously be aware of adding headings to these slides that we do. And that takes a little bit of practice and a little bit of skill. But, you know, like everything that we do when we learn how to drive or use a microwave effectively or plant in the garden, just takes a little bit of time just to be aware of it. And we add and absorb this new skill into our everyday practices, which is kind of great. Um, so this is one of my favorite things. So ornamental or decorative uh, is about alternative text for images. So adding alt text is easy to do once you're aware of what it is. So alt text, alternative text can be added to an image. So like I said earlier, if someone is blind, they can't necessarily tell what's in the image. So they need someone like me or you to add it in manually. So here we have an image. And when I right click it, I scroll down that context menu and I see something called view alt text. And here, oh, oh, actually it's brilliant. Yeah, I don't know why it's got a strange piece of text. It's just called decorative. So I'm gonna remove that because like, you know, if it is just decorative, I can just click this decorative box. Um, so if it has no particular meaning to it and it's just there to make the slide look pretty, I can mark it as decorative. But in this case, uh, I'm going to add a piece of text, an icon of a camera. And that's been added. I can click off a box. So now I've added my alt text to my icon. So now when a person is using a screen reader, their screen reader is going to be able to read that alt text description seamlessly with their uh, screen reader and it's going to tell them that's an icon of a camera. Um, and then if anyone has ever met or spoke to a student uh, before who's blind, it's a really interesting chat speaking to them because um, I've had quite a few chats with blind students over the years about alt text and ultimately they have from my experience, a really common message where if people are worried or concerned uh, about adding alt text, that they even appreciate bad alt text. So like, I find that they're really forgiving. Um, so even if alt text is a little bit kind of off point, at least they can still glean what the image is about. So I've noticed over the years, sometimes people are just really afraid just to dive in and try alt text and just even write something. Uh, but if uh, you do have a blind student and you do have conversations with them, sometimes even students have particular ways of um, describing the types of alt text that they want. So if someone, I, I've noticed that if someone maybe is um, blind from birth, they generally want very short, succinct information. But if someone has kind of acquired blindness later on in years, um, sometimes they'll generally want to know sometimes like the colors used or the shapes in a logo, something like that. So definitely having conversations with your students is actually really, really helpful in terms of you then knowing what kind of alt text to write with those students in mind that you're teaching. Okay, so are we still okay? Any questions about alt text? Okay. Okay. Well, that's great. Normally I get a few tricky questions, but you're going to say on. just one, one, that's not a question as much as yeah. kind of, I mean, Trevor, I struggle with that when I write alt text was that I say to myself, who, who is my audience? And, and I know for, for, in my sake, I'm you know really authoring predominantly for staff um, who may or may not need that. But I, I always feel that bit, just privileged, uh, you know, writing something about a logo or colors when that might leave out someone that really doesn't need that information or it's not relevant to. So yeah. I, and perhaps it's the former English teacher in me that wants to be descriptive, but then struggles knowing. So I don't know yeah. if there's any advice on that, but that, that sticks with me. I think every time I do it, especially depending on the image. Yeah. Well, that's a really good point because 
I've actually asked blind students about this. So um, so there was one student in particular, now he's graduated from TU Dublin since, and his name was Paul. And I would actually say to him, Paul, you know, like when I'm writing alt text, sometimes I'm a bit conscious about, you know, because I'm a, I have a visual art background. So I would love to describe like the colors and the logo and the shapes and that. And he was like, nope, just keep it short, succinct. I don't need to know. If I don't need to know it or it's not relevant to what I'm doing, just don't write about it. And it was brilliant because then I realized, oh, my God, it took all this weight off me that I was like free to write short, succinct passages uh, describing very succinctly what was described in the image. Um, and then, uh, like, he was even great to get advice with uh, in terms of even from bar charts. You know, mm -hmm. like, even as a sighted person, when I'm looking at a bar chart, am I really taking in every single detail of the bar chart and what's going on? Like, maybe not. So... So he's quite good at just explaining, like, ultimately, just write down what's the purpose of the bar chart, what is the lecturer, the teacher, or the professional just trying to impart onto the student with mm -hmm. that particular graph in mind. And mm -hmm. then I, and then when he said that, I was like, oh, yeah, I mean, that is the thing. So he didn't want the full description of each bar and what rate they were at and all that. He just literally just wanted, did you just tell me what I need to know from this graph? Okay. And it was fantastic. It was really, it was like one of the best pieces of advice. And that's because I actually just went to him and I asked, like, please just give me tips around how I can write alt text for you. Um, and I think students really appreciate it as well when you just ask them. Um, and sometimes it's the, what the answer they give you is actually simpler than the answer you're kind of inventing in your head as well, which is even better, you know, because it takes off so much more pressure. It's great. So, yeah. so thanks for that. No, it's interesting because if if we do have the audience to to really get contextual, you know, realistic feedback from them, of course, you know, we might as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I've definitely learned to ask more, um, because even like googling alt text and trying to find the information is great to put context on the types of ways you can add it, but ultimately, like if you have, a, say, a student in this case, and they have a particular requirement. Uh, I mean, chances are you might be writing alt text for six months, a year, four years, maybe, depending on how long you have the student. So, I mean, I think that's the incentive is like, you know, make sure you're, if you're going to go to the effort of writing alt text, make sure that it's something that they actually want or need. Um, uh, and actually, that's the other thing. I've got two blind students who uh, don't know how to use screen, or actually have never been trained how to use screen readers. Um, so they don't use any screen reader technology as well. So they just have a tiny bit of sight and they zoom in very close. So, uh, and that's just interesting to note as well, that not every blind student knows how to use a screen reader or wants to use a screen reader. So... It's just interesting. I don't know how exactly they're getting by, but they're passing their exams somehow. Um, but yeah, so I think as well, I kind of engineered this particular type of blind student in my head as well, that they all use screen readers and they all use the same technologies a particular way. And I'm finding that's definitely not the case. They all have very different ideas about the technology they use or want to use, where they're at very different levels. Um, yeah, so... There's yeah. there's one other thing about it, um, Trevor. I I would be an all text ninja now at this stage because Great. of my because of my colleague Patricia McCarthy because oh, of yeah. all, all the help she gave me, and I actually would not post a picture unless I have time to do the all text as well. Like it, she says, a, you know, a, an image without all text is an incomplete image in a digital world, and I and I. I now read the alt text on every picture that that passes me by. And it's amazing what you can do with the alt text and how much enhancement. Oh, yeah. Could, I've seen people, you see, you've got a thousand characters in alt text. So now I've pe seen people say, you know, they, they're using the alt text cleverly to add more information to 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 their to their host or, or whatever it might be. Um, one thing that maybe you and Stephen could help us with later on is, it's making it's making alt text carry along with pictures that's frustrating me. So I've been trying to if you if you kill yourself doing a lovely, really good alt text on a picture in one medium, mm -hmm. 
and I was trying it with WordPress. If I put the alt text into WordPress and then auto tweeted or auto mastered on the WordPress, would the alt text carry with the picture? And I, I can't, I can't figure it out yet, but that's for, that's for the, that's for the broader oh. Q&A later on. Okay. Experts. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm definitely happy to figure that out. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. No, well, that's good to know. Yeah. But definitely there's lots of different things. And there's a few websites that really, really help with alt text. Um, say, for example, we've got a few different students who are in different disciplines. Um, so, for example, the needs of a blind student who's doing nursing when it comes to alt text for images are going to be quite different from a blind student who's learning coding. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things uh, that coders love to do is take screen grabs of coding and how beautiful it looks. And to a blind student, like that needs alt text. So one of the big problems is like, how do you generate alt text of a screen grab of coding? Um, and there's a few things that we've tried. We haven't figured out completely yet but um how to get it totally accurate but uh yeah there's a few kind of ocr types of ways of converting the text in the image into like text um and using that as alt text but it's i, I don't know i've never found it 100 percent accurate um but anyway that's a whole other thing so steven might have the answer for that later which is great because like i would want that answer um okay so then this one, uh, URLs and links. This is the one that catches lots of people out. So adding links to text. For a long time, I was 100% guilty of always writing click here and adding the link to the text, thinking like I was brilliant and amazing. And yeah, so like talking to different students, they put me right uh, about explaining how wrong I was. Um, so ultimately, uh, they were very good at telling me that I need to write a sentence and the sentence needs to describe the, I, I suppose, the destination of the URL, like what they're going to find at the end of it. So here in pink, I have an example of what's called a naked URL. So it's literally just copy and paste it from the browser straight down here. And I'm not saying no to this, like I'm guilty of sending like these type of URLs to my partner when I'm trying to get him to encourage uh, well, trying to encourage him to just buy me stuff on Amazon that I want to spend on his credit card, not my own, but anyway, that's a whole other thing. But, um, yeah, but for the greater and wider population, uh, say when I'm communicating to all my students, instead of just sending them this URL, I would, and actually I might just exit, uh, I'll just copy the URL and then copy the sentence that's describing the destination and then right click open the context menu press link and then just paste the url in there oh god i might just change the color so it's kind of more accessible looking and now we have the description of the destination uh, which is basically like a web page and DCU about inclusive technology. And that's it. It's that simple. So that's a big thing. And and even just further explain the whole click here thing. Um again, I had another blind student and he was burning to telling me like his screen reader, um he well he basically showed me that he had a page where it had click here and all the links there. And his screen reader pulls up all these click here's into one place. And then he hit like about 12 click here's uh, pulled up by a screen reader and there's no description of what these links are going to. So he had to manually click into each of the 12 links to find out what was the point of them. So what this simple thing does of just creating a description uh, like this, a sentence, short sentence about the destination just means for him or for anyone who uses a screen reader that it just pulls up all these by a screen reader and he'll know exactly that there's a link here and it's about finding more about inclusive technology in TCU and that's it. And he might cite that he's one to one to look at or not and he can go to the next one. So it just takes a little bit of practice to write it. Um, uh, but yeah, once you get into practice, then you start kind of doing this and it becomes second nature. So it might seem like a big deal at the start, but ultimately, 
you know, when you, it's actually strange when you start seeing it not being done, then you start to get more critical of other people not doing it. This is the other thing. So, um, yeah, so it's a good tip to, and take simple, it just takes a little while to get into the hang of it too. Um, so does anyone have questions about that or thoughts or insights? So no one does click here. No one posts naked URLs on anything and grace. Okay, cool. So, Hi. Hi, yeah. Trevor, I, Go I'm, ahead. I'm always wondering if the link gets broke. What, so when you've got find out more, obviously then the link is on top of the descriptor, description. Yeah. And so I have a habit of ending, I, I have a habit of doing both now. So I, for those people, if the link gets broken or something gets moved or it just, the, the, the learner can't click on it for whatever reason, maybe it's something to do with their browser. Oh, yeah. And I have the paste option down below so i'm like um i have the description da, 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 and then i had if it's not working um copy and paste this into the url so i end up doing both and i like i don't know if i'm doubling up my worker yeah, yeah not... no well i mean i suppose at the end of the day if you don't have blind students i suppose you're being a bit strategic you're giving the size of students an option um like i suppose where i'm kind of thinking and again it was like it wasn't a blind student now she was she's a blind person now and she was she's lovely now um and Nadine kind of showed me this, where she showed me her screen reader on her iPhone reading out a URL, and it literally <laughs> reads out letter by letter by letter by letter by letter by letter until you get to the end. It was like the most annoying experience. So I only had to <laughs> yeah. listen to it for a few seconds. But, and honestly, it really made me step back, and I really thought, like, do I want to make really irritating links for every single blind person who I'm going to write documents for and it yeah. just really made me really aware of how bad links are for a blind user and then how their screen readers read out every single letter mm -hmm. of it and then she showed me one fantastically huge URL and how long it took and I was like okay I need to just go back and I really need to think about making this like a real habit in my in my um own work and how I practice uh, with students. So, the, the, yeah, that's good insight. I mean, I wouldn't have thought in the screen you're really having to read through it. I'm more trying to deal with the technical possibilities of what can occur. Interesting. Oh yeah, yeah. No, but no, I I get it. Um, yeah, because like I used to do the click here because I just thought, oh, you know, for students with ADHD, I'm literally telling them like click here on this point, and then I realized, oh, okay, so like you know, where I'm advantaging one, I'm disadvantaging another one with this rule. So I just need to make it a common rule. Don't worry, um, Trevor. As a student with profound and ADHD, it won't help. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to uh, mention something for Francis. I mean, when when people began using the internet, and I, I know you're all too young to remember this in Ireland, but there was examples of people printing out, like, you know, I, I was trying to book this airline ticket and I couldn't get it to work, so I've printed the URL and they'd bring it to you and it'd be like a full page with all these codes and ran what looked like random letters that they weren't random but if you're going to type them in you know it would uh -huh. take you a long time and we laugh at that now but screen readers effectively interpret interpret that as a long string of text and they're going to read it out so uh, i think there's three roughly three levels to be aware of there's the naked url like we've been talking about the decorated one where you see click here but we would recommend it it be the official title of the page or section you're linking to with the url rather than click here which is something i'm guilty of myself and then the this is more work but it's it's the the maybe the the premium um you know hardest thing to do but the most valuable and useful is if you're often including the same links a lot in your documents maybe in different documents in multiple places invest in a url shortener and um, there are free ones, but having a personalized one is really good for two reasons. One, you can build up a, um, you know, a, a sort of branded, you know, DCUIE slash one word. And that word brings you to wherever it is. And the other reason is you can put tracking on those links to if a student says I clicked on the link and, you know, there was no help. You can actually check if the link has been clicked at all. Um, that's extra work, but it can be very useful for metrics of I'm putting stuff up on Moodle or any of my students clicking them. Um, but it is a little bit of extra work, but it gives everyone something useful, a short URL. That's not just a big string of random numbers and it's not just click here and it gives you extra data as well, but it, yeah. it is a little bit of extra work. 
Yeah, although Google used to have like a little extension that did that really quickly. You just press it and then it was in. But yeah, it depends which domains you're in. And yeah, so I can't use that anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, might, you might have to invest in one, but there, yeah. there are lots of them. Uh, you need to be using one that's approved by your organization. So, mm-hmm. you know, 100%. Uh, yeah. And also, uh, one of the most popular free ones went out of business. So all those links don't work anymore. And the, oh. yeah. And Twitter, that was it. It broke and, loads of them too. <laughs> and some of them are like sort of paid subscription. So you can have it free for like two weeks and then suddenly all the links stop working. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Interesting, guys. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, here is my nerdy section, the sensor section. Um, so this is going to take about maybe a good two hours to get through this particular slide, I think, but I'm going to try and shorten it down to five minutes. Um, so when we talk about sans serif, ultimately it's about accessible fonts. So fonts that are easy to read, increase readability, that are not only good for just people with disabilities, but just good for everyone. They just help us all to read more effectively for faster and better understanding. And just if just these little tiny considerations of font help um, just anyone in any capacity whatsoever, that is an easy win in my eyes. So, uh, and then since in a, a session I did a few weeks ago, some people, someone actually asked me to, you know, what are these sans serifs and just listed them. So, so Calibri, Helvetica and Verdana are easy ones. They've probably seen on all the font lists that you've ever used. And I didn't have my two favorites, which is Queen Sure and Century Gothic and, yeah, I think Kate heard me earlier. Kitty heard me a bit earlier talking about them. So I'm going to try to hold my excitement in about Futura and Century Gothic. But um, yeah, if you want to explore really beautiful fonts, uh, try Futura. I, it's kind of, kind of amazing. And I just find it easy to read. And I think it just really looks effective as well. And there's tons out there. So even if you Google sans serif fonts, in general, it's going to guide you to the right places because there's ones called Roboto as well. There's tons out there. And, um, uh, you know, they're just short to synced and just help with that whole reading experience. Um, and just simple things like the spacing. So if the spacing in the lines of text that you're using looks cramped, then it probably is cramped, which means it's going to be difficult for some to read. So I suppose when I think about readability, I'm, generally I'm thinking about students who have dyslexia. You know, anything that improves that dyslexia um, experience just by line spacing and fonts, that's an easy win and making sure that font is kind of left justified. So on the left hand side of the screen is great. I tried to avoid centering like the designer in me loves to center text. So I have to pull myself back from that. Um, but yeah, uh, that's great. And then even just other little things about, you know, using bullet points. I think we all use bullet points anyway, to some degree. And for our screen reader, um, that's an even bigger win because the screen reader will know something if it's in bullet point form um, then they'll read it out. The person knows that it's going to be short, succinct, really to the point, which is great for students with dyslexia. I've said bullet points are brilliant, especially numbered points as well, especially numbered ones because it's usually step by step by step and you can just tell visually that there's a number. You just follow the numbers to get to your destination. Great. Fantastic cuts down on huge lengthy pieces of paragraph to explain something. I, I'm a big fan of them myself. And other things like avoiding all caps as well. Oh, sorry. Was someone going to say something? Sorry, Trevor. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. many years ago, I read an, um, a paper and the yeah. suggestion was that the sensory fonts were very, very good for headings. But actually, right. the, if you had a couple of paragraphs of text that the serif font was preferable because the serifs themselves acted as a guide as I, the I could jump in here page. as well, Pat. Sorry? We're, we're showing our age, Pat, because yeah. long, long ago you were taught to use serif fonts if you wanted to put it onto paper for students to read, but then go for, for sans serif on the computer screen. That was definitely, I can't remember which era we're talking yeah. about. Oh, if that, I, I, keep, I assume that, that that whole notion of the serifs guiding the eye along the line. Yeah, they still, I think, go skip. serif in exam papers. I'm now not 100% sure they may have yeah. changed on for, for, for those, but gosh, I'm really showing my age. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like, I, I don't know. Like, like, may, like, could have very easily been. Like, uh, I don't know. Like, but actually, one of the things just about font styles that still strikes me as being strange, you know, like, um, 
people might get the criteria about how their thesis should be written. You know, and Times Roman is very often still the font of choice. So, and that's like a serif font. So I don't know, there's little things that are still slow to change those traditions of fonts within our writing and academic writing. Um, maybe are still holding on to the past a little bit. Yeah. But, um, yeah, some of it has to do with expectation, doesn't it? You know, they'll tell you to use a particular font because that audience is expecting that we're, you know, thinking back to newspaper yeah. choices, etc. cetera. Yeah, yeah. That's, so, that's pretty much knocked in the head anyway, that notion that you use your, your, your sensory for the um, headings and your three for the heavy text. Yeah. Like and it's and it's like like one thing that I would love and I love seeing students do this is that say when they do get their word document or slides that they can alter the font styles themselves to their own preferences as well. Mm. So that's one of the reasons why I do like you know giving the students whatever word document or whatever PowerPoint that I'm making, and I just encourage them to like you go and you do whatever you want to this information and you personalize it, change the background colors, whatever it is you want. And by giving them the Word document and the PowerPoint, they can do that. When you, when you If you start sharing the PDF of something though, that's when uh, you're kind of limiting the choice and the possibilities a little bit. So that's one of the reasons why I just try to stay away from the whole PDF thing. Um, yeah, just because, you know, there's a lot less you can do with them um, really. Uh, and then last point is just avoiding jargon. Uh, or if you are going to have jargon, just have explainers. So even acronyms, uh, even in DCU, we're full of acronyms. So our student support service is called SSND. And then I'm in the disability service and we're called DLSS. And then we have uh, like a community that's kind of common to us all where we're all trying to do good. And that's called Care and Connect. So that's C&C. So basically in SSND, where I work in DLSS, we're all connected to CNC. And that can be a little bit acronym heavy for a lot of people. And that's only starting the acronym. So there's way more in our small kind of student services. So, you know, things like that can, you know, just be a little mindset of changing just in terms of like, you know, our own uh, services and how we use acronyms without even thinking about it. Um, that for like the first years or new students, that you know maybe we just need to rethink these kind of acronyms a little bit. Uh, okay, the fun bit: evaluating accessibility. So I know we've been in PowerPoint, but basically, you know, whether you're using PowerPoint or a Word document or something general, they're all kind of like the same idea when it comes to accessibility. And in this one, um. Why I particularly like Word and PowerPoint is that, you know, they've got pretty good accessibility checkers in it. Because uh, even today when I presented to staff about it, someone was saying like, oh, you know, love using Google Docs and Google Slides, and which is great. And I love using Google Docs and Slides myself. But the accessibility checker is a little bit more limited in what it can do compared to um, Microsoft Office Word and PowerPoint. So to get a PowerPoint, better um, experience, especially if you're new to accessibility, when it comes to evaluating that accessibility of your documents or whatever it is they're making, um, you get more support um, in Microsoft, um, maybe than Google tools, but then, you know, whatever you learn then from Microsoft, you can apply then to your Google Docs or Google Slides. So, you know, the, it's, so I kind of like using both of them because like sometimes I'll have a preference when I'm making something that will kind of lean into PowerPoint a bit more, but still sometimes I'll use Google Slides for something different uh, and that's okay. So do I, people have preferences about what they use? Are people more Google Slides or PowerPointy? I, I would... I would work in Google Slides and default into it. Use it for drawing a lot. But oh, yeah. Yeah. When you, gosh, PowerPoint is very powerful if you want to do your yes, accessibility checks, but also if you want to turn it into a short video. It, it PowerPoint is has really, really it's, <laughs> upped yeah. its game in the last few years. Oh yeah. Like the only thing is Microsoft Online is just I mean it's not fun. Oh, I, I, I'm going to wear it. It's got too many notes. iterations and one measures in centimeters, one measures in inches, and you can't get it to change. But anyway, that's just me oh. whinging. You keep going. <laughs> that's okay. 
<laughs> I know because actually I love the Microsoft Online, so I mostly use that. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. So no, it's 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 weird. Like everyone has their own preferences, which is good because you know we've got choice there, and we can choose what we want, and that's good. Um, and the great thing about the evaluator checker in the Microsoft tools that it pretty much kind of will check most things or a lot of things and then what I like about it is and it will actually check here is that it'll flag even a support so let's go to the checker so if we go to review so in the review tab there's check accessibility and uh, we can see oh fantastic there's loads of issues naughty boy naughty I know I know, I know. so I've got a duplicate slide title so if I click on us, uh, it'll hopefully, oh, layout information. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there is a little thing going on there just in terms of how I duplicated mm -hmm. the slide title there. That's okay. But right now, let's go down and we'll make an accessibility issue. Um, let me just see. I wonder if someone was asking me earlier about font colors and stuff like that. Um, uh, don't know if it's going to figure it out because some because we actually were messing around with it. Oh no, that's not good. Um, so where's our font color? <laughs> I think that's pretty hard to read. But does this does it come about instantly? Is it live when we review this? Oh. Uh, no. Oh, there is something missing object description. Oh, because they use Google Slides. They downloaded this from Google Slides. Tut, tut, tut. Tut, I know, <laughs> which is good, though, because we can really put it. There in. you go. Been there, there done go. that. So decorative. Fantastic. Yeah. That's OK. So let's go to view alt text. Mark is decorative. That's great. Mark is so decorative. if it's decorative, I assume the screen reader just ignores it completely. Is it that... totally ignores us. Yeah, it's yeah. great. It's like visiting your family. Uh, just totally, just totally blanks you. It's great. Um, and if 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 we're not clicking the decorative, what's occurring with the screen reader on like something like a little green line like that? What 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 what's occurring for the screen reader? Oh, it just skips us. Yeah, the screen reader will just totally skip us. Yeah. So, so it, it skips it if you click decorative and it skips it if you don't click decorative. Oh, you know, if you well, if say, you don't like, click decorative, what's occurring? Like so if I write nothing. It'll shout yeah, at you and, from the alt text. Oh yeah, well apart from that, I'm thinking on the screen reader from the from the screen reader perspective. If you have an image and you haven't clicked, you haven't alt texted it and you haven't clicked it's decorative. I would always have assumed that it would skip it anyway because there's no text for the reader to read. Oh, no. But is that not is that not what's occurring? No, like it well, it's definitely not yes. skipping us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but that's a good point. A good what's point. No, even yeah. So the latest um more, let's say, ag aggressive alt text uh, supports put in if you don't, they put in what they think. So it's uh, an AI uh, analysis of it and say, yeah, it's a cat or something. Uh, okay. But usually it's one or two words. And I was a tester on that. And I was using a picture of Molly. I think Mags has seen this picture of Molly, my, my 13 year old, who was then five sitting on a hay bale. And it went from a little girl uh, in a field to a little girl on a sunny day uh, sitting in a field. And then the next version was a person sitting in a field. You know, and it kept changing a little bit as the model got better over time. But yeah. at one point, they introduced a, if you don't set it, we'll set it unless you mark it as decorative. So in other okay, words, very good. Generating oh. it. I, I hope and I think they've pulled back from that because it's a little bit aggressive is not the right word, but like, you know, mm -hmm. putting these sort of uh, alt text on it is is good. But I think you need to approve each one. And that's what the accessibility checker will do. It will say, approve these or mark them as decorative. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So, and is the AI still evolving for the Altex? Or... Yeah, for for um, the last so many years, um, they used machine learning um, image analysis, which uh, was really cool. I, I'm going to say 2017 was when it first came out. 
Uh, pretty amazing that button appeared where you could say, you know, what is this? Um, now they use a generative AI model instead, um, which can generate much more verbose and, and fancy uh, descriptions, but um, are held back by the fact that they are only as good as what they're trained on. And I had an example in the chat, um, mm. uh, two Hurleys um, sitting on a, a wooden thing and it thinks they're makeup brushes. And it gives a lovely alt text about these. Oh. <laughs> I read that and I was like, this is, I mean, there's too much in it, but it's fine. And then I found out it was girly. So yeah. Like, oh. yeah. So uh, whenever, and, and like you, you get so used to these generated ones that you can nearly tell which model is behind them because there's only a dozen models out there. And uh, it, it's a very hard problem to solve culturally. Mm. Mm. Okay. Now that's, Good to know, yeah. So do you think it'll get to the point maybe in the very near future where we'll be able to write pretty accurate alt text? But I know it's always contextual based, but so it's kind of hard to tell. So pr prompt based generation, yes, because you can say, assume the following. Uh, I want short to the point. I want very elaborate. You know, you, you can actually guide it. For oh. the non-guided ones, the machine learning ones, they, they operate in a different way. They analyze the whole image and generate tags of what objects are there. And maybe if there's a major action, they can recognize about three or 4,000 distinct objects. But if you something that's maybe a diagram or has never been seen before because it's just completely wild, they can't interpret that. So, for instance, uh, on your slide 23, it will say this is a vector comic art of two people holding a laptop and a book. And mostly you'd be fine with that, except you'd say, well, wait a minute, it's, it's not a book. And it doesn't say that one of them has pink hair. And, and it'll be like, well, you want to do it straight to the point. If you want an elaborate mm -hmm. thing, it'll do that too. Mm -hmm. But I do think there needs to be human in the loop for alt text uh, because the, the consumer here is not the screen reader. It's the user of the screen reader. And the human in the loop here, the teacher, the writer, the content author can say, you know what, that's a very elaborate thing when you want one or two sentences the newer gen ai ones you can say one or two sentences max and will do it the other ones harder and, and this this human here wants to play a game where we present a picture to the ai and ask it to write descriptive you know to write an alt text and then put that alt text into another ai and see what picture it comes up with <laughs> That's my. <laughs> that would be kind that, of interesting. That, yeah, that's a little rainy day. That's a little rainy day occupation. Now that could be really funny, or vice, you know, vice versa. Start with the text, generate the image, get the the get the AI's pal to gen to 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 bring back some text for that one. That could be really an ever decreasing circle. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to see that now. Yeah, we'll be interested to see how it evolves over time. Uh, um okay well that's good to know well and then even just come to the end of the session just to hit home like the reason why i suppose i use house is it's becoming more and more important and we're definitely seeing the higher education that that idea of belonging is becoming so poignant especially in this if i can say post-covid society um like we do see students socially, um, I, I'm not sure if it's struggling or there's a new norm of not being as social happening. Um, and we can definitely see it in the campus and the amount of students kind of maybe just not hanging around like they used to. Um, and unfortunately, well, maybe not, it's unfortunate, but they seem to be um, retaining their secondary school friends and maybe not making as many um, friends as they used to maybe in higher education. So there's definitely a shift in the whole social experience in higher education with students. So it's just interesting to kind of see it. And it's slowly changing for the better. We see them, like definitely compared to last year, interacting a lot more with the campus. But even um, just even little things to note, like we're still seeing kind of gaps in the interaction, like um, the student union had to redo their elections because they didn't get the, the minimum quota of votes by students. So that they had to rerun them. And even just events, um, that students union would have done which historically pre-COVID which would have got like a high traction um, at times now they're having to cancel those kind of events that would have had high traction before because they're just not selling enough tickets to the students so 
So there's definitely change. So whether it's the long commutes, the cost of living, all these kind of things are all impacting on that social engagement piece. So, um, and I suppose just even put in context, like why I talk about accessibility, and I know it was only a tiny part of all this inclusion uh, puzzle that we're all trying to figure out, but at least if it's kind of a pretty factual skill to have. So if we can like at least tackle inclusion skills or inclusion at the, the maximizing the inclusion potential uh, for our students by just adding alt text and thinking about heading so students can navigate and interact more with digital content that's at least solving some part of that inclusion factor um so again it's a pretty easy thing for us to control once we develop the skills and the awareness so we just kind of play a little part in that as well as all the other amazing work that we all do in education and um, that's just a little part of it so it's just about accumulating all these skills really um okay and then quite so like even just to put together this picture here like even my own self I, i'm trying to draw attention to students about these inclusive technologies so like the stuff we have in google and microsoft and dictation tools and even i've got a section about accessibility so trying to expose students to accessibility what that looks like the types of skills that even mentioned before in this i'm trying to outlay them as well in that and even talk a little bit in this compass resource that we have about UDL as well, that universal design for learning, just even make them aware of choice and options that they can control by using inclusive technologies and thinking about accessibility as well. And, and this resource compass, like I share it as well with the communities. So if you have an, a VLE or LMS and you have H5P in it, um, I share all the SCORM files that I've made. So you can go and you can take them all and then you can edit them um, to personalize them for your own. So right now they're in a DCU context. So some of the videos are mentioned in DCU, but you, know, you can easily just tweak it and change those kind of few short videos for your own context. That's okay. So just kind of help, again, that message of inclusion for students as well in this whole kind of new landscape of inclusion that they're kind of experiencing now post-COVID. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to only ask me very easy questions. I'm <laughs> happy to answer those kinds of questions. Any difficult questions, Stephen is here and he loves the <laughs> questions. So that's great. Yeah. <laughs> I I have another question. At some point along the line, I've heard that the you've got capital letters there, avoid using capital letters. But somewhere along the line, I heard that was like yeah. out of date mm -hmm. or where are we at with, with that it's definitely don't be using capital letters and did i like am i making that up where did that come from anybody else hear that it, it just letters, keeps yeah. Nina shouting in text mm. long mm -hmm. ago <laughs> stop shouting yep oh yeah like and even just the other thing i think but like all that kind of capitalized text is it's just a bit trickier to read i don't know i'm kind of like I prefer lowercase to read. So, and I think pretty much it's, you know, it's easier to make out the shapes of the letters and the words uh, when we use lowercase. But the other thing is like, if you are using uppercase, like why would you be using it a lot in a full sentence? That's One it. thing to throw in, we oh. must use our camel case or our Python case or our snake oh, yeah. case. Isn't it that, isn't the capital thing also to do with the screen reader? You know, it stops and it stops for a second when it hits a capital an uppercase letter. That's so not, I'm wondering. We're That's doing the... chat IE. We capitalize the E, the C, and the I to get okay. the screen reader know that it's not a chutty. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I think we know the whole thing about camel case is so, you know, at least sighted people can break up the words more easier. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what well, there's something the screen, controversial? The screen, reader, the screen reader needs it to, to make it sound more. more like broken up words rather than gobbledygook and but wasn't there something controversial about that before in the newspapers like but wasn't we, there there was some hashtag that was misinterpreted by the americans and it started in the uk no no i'm gonna write them in the chat but i can't say them because you're oh. recording this and um, oh, okay. so I'll, I'll i'll give two examples that really did happen okay, <laughs> okay. Was this about uh, share? There was no. one about share. Okay. No, no you're you're right. you're thinking of Susan Boyle, but yeah, that's coming up. <laughs> so would you go to this URL? Possibly, you know. 
Because maybe you wanted to go to an expert's exchange oh. where you'd exchange information with an expert. Yeah. But that's not what everyone saw. And then uh, you might you might want to go to uh, a shop that specializes in selling uh, this is really interesting. And uh, they're, they wow. decided they were on the pen island because they're just full of pens. But that's not what everyone thought when they went to that URL. <laughs> No. And then the worst one was a hashtag to launch Susan Boyle's album. And they decided they would have a oh. party for her album. And it was an album party because who wouldn't want to go to an album party? That would just be amazing. And uh, an album party hashtag with no capitals <laughs> does not come out the way they intended. And that <laughs> went viral. And they thought, wow, everyone loves this new album. And that's um, not why it went viral. No, so no. capitals, I'm a big fan of. <laughs> in the yeah. middle of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. this is this is getting like the portal to New York now. <laughs> <laughs> we, we make the official point that proofreading is important and ask critical friends to examine yeah. more before it gets out there. Yeah, I, do remember, I do remember those now that I see them. Yeah, yeah, because mine was totally harmless. Uh, I think it was like uh, that share is dead was the one, and the Americans thought it was that share is dead. And it was like an outpouring. Um, oh, yes. yeah, yeah. Oh, so my that's goodness. yeah. Oh, yeah. Easily happen, folks. Capitals. Yeah. Uh, the odd capital letter. You don't have to be all capitals. Just the odd. Mm -hmm. It's true. Yeah. No, but thanks a lot. I, I will. I, I'm open that you learned something from that. You shared a few things. Like, I'm definitely, yeah, I need to go and check. Like, I want to clarify what does a screen reader do if the alt text section is just blank? So, if the decorative isn't ticked, are they, I, I actually don't know. Really, only two main screen readers on the market. Like, there's lots of different yeah. ones, but you know, the, the major one is two. One is quite an expensive one, the other is completely free. And, you know, there's some people who swear by different ones. What I would uh, do here is uh, always defer to Donald Fitzpatrick, who was in DCU and is now in um, the NDA, uh, because I've never met anyone who knows more about er the ins and outs of screen readers and uh, assistive technology for blind users, um, particularly in maths and coding. But uh, a amazing thing he, he taught me about screen readers was that um, they're so much faster at reading out to people who've been using them a long time, like he has. Um, so when I hear his screen reader, I can't follow what it's saying. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, Irish, like I think all of you. So we're used to hearing people speaking very fast mm -hmm. and doing it ourselves. But it is nothing compared to a screen reader. It goes so fast and he can understand it perfectly. But then he's reading huge documents and lots of code and he can scan it with the screen reader. So something that to us is a minor annoyance can really trip up a screen reader and go from something that's super fast for him who's scanning through the document only he's listening rather than looking at it to well let's just stop my flow and that was a shock to me because you know i was putting in alt text but i wasn't putting in alt text in a way that was useful to him so i have to commend uh Trevor, because like absolutely everything you've said tonight is perfectly correct and the right way to approach accessibility. It's been it's phenomenal to to hear this, especially, you know, for GAM. I mean, it's something that not enough educators are doing. When my first set of slides were acetates that I gave to students, mm -hmm. you know, and if you were to say, well, what about a blind student in your class? I would have said, like many people, well, I don't have any blind students. But what about your students next year? Well, you don't know who they're going to be. And now I'll never meet most of my students. So I have 24,000 students who, who are consuming material all the time. I have no idea of their accessibility needs. So I have to write with that in mind. And that has really changed uh, the approach. And I have colleagues who've struggled with that. And they, you know, think, well, you know, it's very few people. And, you know, the answer is, yeah, but. You're thinking only of the the major, very obvious accessibility challenges, the visible, uh, you know, disabilities, as they say, which, you know, it's quite ironic because one of them is that it's nothing is visible. And, uh, you know, I often 
you know, wonder when we're going to have the same accessibility and inclusivity uh, revolution for the invisible disabilities, especially when it comes to learning. And I want to commend DCU and all the folks who work in DCU because it is Ireland's first autism friendly university. Um, and my son, Jack, who is autistic, uh, applied there. That wasn't the only reason. Um, he did CTYI there and he knew the place. He was familiar with it. He was comfortable with it. But it was a major reason. And he got into uh, his degree of choice. The, on the first day, they have an early sort of uh, induction for the students like Jack. And I totally agree with what Trevor is saying. Jack gets gets up we drive him to the bus he goes for exactly the classes he has he walks straight back to Whitehall and gets on the bus home mm -hmm. and he cannot conceive of any reason to stay there he doesn't know anyone except the lecturers and he doesn't see any way of meeting or getting to know anyone in his class because he goes for the classes and he goes home and I wish I could change that so that he could have a more inclusive experience but it was actually quite interesting to hear what Trevor said that it's not just Jack because I was assuming it was just Jack so hearing that mm -hmm. makes me a little bit more relieved um, and I'd love to see a, a house for students with autism students with ADHD I was a student in DCU with autism and ADHD but I wasn't diagnosed mm -hmm. so I didn't get to benefit from any of these amazing things so it's wonderful to see and I hope Trevor gets to continue doing it in DCU for a long time <laughs> no thanks no i mean it's a really interesting time with students and it's great that so much is happening like even in dcu we've got like a well-being center now um that just took off there a few months ago so i mean everyone's trying to adapt and change how they work and evolve services um because i know students are just changing and evolving and we're still trying to figure out uh what what these students are um, and what they're like and what's, what do they want and what do they need. So we're constantly asking them, trying out different things, but um, yeah, no, we're, yeah, it's definitely an interesting time in higher education. Yeah. Um, no, brilliant. Well, thanks so much for chatting and interacting. I, have to say, I think this has been one of the most interactive uh, online sessions I've ever had. So that's big plus. And uh, people have had their cameras on. I can't many times that happened. That's yeah. for you, Trevor. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, can I can I say thank you for the H O U S E? That will just there's my silent mental checklist as I'm doing my documents. I'm already an all text ninja for the photographs and the camel case, um, whatever. <laughs> but you know, and now I can just go him, yeah, 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 yeah. Fix me, Earls. Do do whatever. So that it's it's great to have a just the crutch of 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 um checklist thank you yeah that's no problem is that the boland checklist that is yeah. well right now it's the trevor checklist which is working for me now but who knows house could evolve into something else mm -hmm. uh, right so it's yeah. this is this is this is this is Trevor Bowl in 2024 for the moment. Thank you. 2024 for the moment. Yeah, yeah. So 2025 could be the city. So you could have an extension to the house. There could be an extension <laughs> yeah. to the house the next time you're in. Yeah. Another story. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, can I just check, Abby, do you want to throw anything into the mix? We're all very yappy when we get together. Do you want to jump in for a second? Yeah. So I'm kind of a random ad. I was actually sent your link by a friend. Um, I work for a small rare disease nonprofit in the US, but we have a global presence and I have a graduate certificate in assistive technology. So when I started at my job, I started our accessibility initiative to get everything up to date in our materials that we present out. Um, we actually have actually quite a few community members from Ireland um, as well. So I like being in this call because I feel like I'm chatting with all of them. Um, <laughs> But we've been working hard on that. So we just posted about our initiative to our community for the first time because it's been in behind the scenes, but we use today as kind of an announcement to let them all know what we've been doing. Um, but yeah, I'm just always, I'm still learning, figuring out the best ways to make it happen. And I'm uh, very interested in presenting to other small nonprofits that like more realistic ways that you can start implementing it that don't have to, I think when you have a small staff, you just assume that's too many steps to start implementing. Um, 
So there's a few networks that I'm a part of that I'm presenting to later this year about how we've been able to do it with a volunteer force and things like that. Yeah. That's oh, great. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but it is. Yeah, yeah. That is powerful. Well, thank you. I I really enjoy it. So it's it's very it's very interesting. And I really in my assistive technology degree, I just wanted to to learn more about it, but I Digital accessibility was kind of the thing that snuck in there as something that I didn't know I was interested in. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to link up with you if you want. Yeah. Because yeah? I've been dabbling with AT for a little while. So, yeah, happy to chat about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think there's in the rare disease community that I'm like so involved in, there's so many small organizations and so many of them are serving people with disabilities or that might eventually need to access their materials that I think they just aren't reaching out to all of them and i just don't think they know because yeah. every time i bring it up where i'm like what about your colors like have you checked your brand like what are you oh, even just yeah. like the simplest things a lot of these small orgs are hand designing uh, logos they're picking like they're doing their best with very little resources um so i think accessibility goes like far from their minds when i think there's there's ways that we can make it happen well even that point about the branding and that like have you heard of someone in the uk called matthew Deep Rose, I think his name is. Oh, it sounds, uh, sounds kind of familiar. Yeah, he's great at that particular type of work. So he's on LinkedIn. Uh, but yeah, like I put in my email address into the box. So uh, feel free and like, um, yeah, if I think of people or, yeah, organizations here. Because even in Ireland, we have an online AT event that's happening on Friday. Or sorry, next Monday. So it's Monday for three mornings and it's... Um, yeah, just all about people who use and experience and advocate assistive technology and inclusion. Um, yeah, so I'll, I can send you on a few links, just different stuff anyway as well. Yeah, that'd be great. I'll send you an cool. email. I can write that down and I just requested to join your group. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. Okay. That, I mean, thank the, you. You guys are doing uh, great. The quiet fellow on the screen, John, he'll mind you in the, he'll be yeah. your buffer in the, in the, in the mailing <laughs> <laughs> He minds us all, Abby. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're lovely, lovely to have someone from outside of Ireland join, Abby. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I yeah. Felt, I felt like an interloper, but I was like, I love this topic, so I will listen <laughs> at any point in time. That's great. No, thanks for coming along. Yeah, yeah. Because in the States, you've got what Louis Perez as well, who's a big accessibility advocate. Yeah. Uh, and he's amazing. Like his talks are spectacular. Yeah. Yeah. There's some there's some cool stuff happening, and I'm always finding new groups that are doing things and I think bringing them all connected and like, yeah. ed like education is always the place where I feel like it's doing it best and then it trickles out after mm -hmm. that because I think there's just less framework for people to think about who their audience is and what they're presenting to when they're oh yeah presenting in small groups or just locally mm -hmm. they just assume that no one will ever mm -hmm. unless someone has said they're in their audience needs it then they just assume mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. They never yeah. need it. Yeah. It's very yeah. interesting, but I love it. So yeah, yeah. sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. And focus on accessibility is one of the f focuses and pillars of our new literacy, numeracy, digital literacy strategy, yeah. which came out today. So I haven't mm -hmm. had time to to look at the accessibility part. I said I might leave that to Trevor to <laughs> to, to audit <laughs> the document um, at that at that <laughs> that part of it to, to yeah. just to just see but it is good to see it there and yeah. you know centralized yeah yeah sounds good yeah because i gave a presentation i think about a year ago about trying to embed accessibility into marking rubrics so you know how lectures great i know Stephen. i can hear Stephen. that the... <laughs> no 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 i won't say it's the gonna institution. happen i it's won't say the happen. institution no. <laughs> But it's uh, Moodle uploads, upload your assignment. And uh, I'm failing you, you were, you know, 0.5 of a second uh, late uploading it. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can argue and say, well, okay. So if they click the button a second beforehand, it could take two seconds to upload, you know, mm -hmm. but they did click it beforehand. Who's at fault there? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, or like, but they literally would say, no, I'm not marking it because it was late, 0.5 of a second, you know? And, you know, if you were to say, well, the student is autistic and was very anxious and clicked the button 10 times, and that just made it slower, not faster. 
well, I'm not accepting that. Or can you actually not accept that? I mean, a lot of uh, uh, tricky questions. I don't think uh, most uh, educators at the third level have ever thought about assessing students um, with with uh, uh, an accessibility need unless they literally have them sitting in the room in front of them. And that, I think, is a huge challenge at third level. I don't know about the others. Definitely at third level. Sessions. There's going to be follow up sessions, LMS, <laughs> yeah, 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 pitfalls and positives. I, was say, yeah. I, I think Trevor, what this is your third session of the day. I think it's, it's yeah, maybe that's a part two. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a part two. <laughs> part two after some of us have gotten some rest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's good. Well, thanks so much for listening and participating. I have to say, I really enjoyed it. It was great chatting to you. And it's great to hear about accessibility on in the curriculum as well. Like, I think that's going to be a game changer, like huge, hugely. Because yeah. even I just think accessibility in the workplace, um, that's going to be another game changer. And I can just see students moving from education where there's kind of an understand, sort of in a growing awareness right now of accessibility and expecting it in the workplace. So it's going to, yeah, well, in the next 10 years, it's definitely going to evolve, uh, which is great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. God, well. Have a great evening. Our Abby, what time of the day is it over in the States? It is about three o'clock in the afternoon. Three o'clock. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So it's half <laughs> nine PM anyway here. So yeah. Yeah. So we're politely telling Trevor it's okay to go now that we can <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you guys are working late. Oh, Thank you. Okay. All. That's Thanks, what we everyone. Do. Thank well you. Done, so Trevor. Thanks well so done. much. Well Cheers. Done. All right. Have we will be in touch and share resources and recordings and all, all of that Absolutely. administrative stuff in due course. Absolutely. Do you want to stop recording, Pat? Or... Yep. I'll start that now. Which so, I almost did, by, when... by the way, Stephen, does the recording, um, sorry, I've stopped recording now. Uh, does the, re oh, sorry, st I've stopped the video. Um, <laughs> does the recording itself capture the chat? Uh, I don't know. I don't use Zoom. Uh, I don't think it'll, so. it'll save I, the it'll chat. Think so. It'll save the chat as a text, you know, as a text file. Yeah. But we can we can have that destroyed. If we try to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>